The Maine Wabanaki State Child Welfare Truth and Reconciliation Commission uncovered the truth about state child welfare practice with Native people in Maine. The Commission issued recommendations for best child welfare practice based on an examination of both historic documents and stories collected from Native and non-Native people involved in state child welfare. The Commission had to create structures and processes to support truth, healing, and change. In this video, the Commissioners and staff reflect on their work and share lessons learned. I want to spend time alone with the Commissioners. We need some time by ourselves. So uh, I, we all got in a circle. None of us felt like we knew everything we needed to know to do, except that we did know every, we did have, we had everything within us. We didn't know what that was going to look like. And we just had to trust this process. Yeah, we had a growing period, <laughs> you know, after we were seated. Um, I think there was about maybe six months of trying to figure out how do we approach the task at hand. Um, and, you know, to the, to the credit of the people who are chosen to be commissioners, um, maybe we brought our areas of expertise to this. Uh, but I think that we had uh, a, a great insight in the value about the nature of the work. So whatever our egos were, whatever uh, we thought of ourselves, you know, um, was not the basis of how we would have approached this work. And I've seen this in other commissions, you know, how egos play in this. But I think that we all got how important this work and how significant it was. So we were ready and open to do whatever was necessary uh, to fulfill this mandate. So I can bring my experience in, because there's a lot of anxiety around bringing people together to discuss those kinds of, um, that kind of history. And I knew that from my experience that it ends up being very powerful and very healing. Don't worry about how it's going to turn out. This is, we're just going to go with the flow. Um, we've prayed, you know, everyone has prayed about this day, so let's just trust the outcome because I knew it was an answer to prayer, so I knew it was time. My larger contribution was my um, organizational capacity to help build structures and cultures um, and to um, basically create a system that would hold this work. Because there's no manual, you know, and so, um, uh, kind of have a, a, a developing a clarity takes some time. You know? um, and then something as significant as, as this, in that it was not founded, it was, it was not funded from the beginning, and we had to raise our own funds, you know, and, and spent a lot of time uh, preliminary coming up, up with funds and uh, to do that, uh, to do the work initially, and, and right from the beginning, um, when there was some discussion about how each of the commissioners were going to be compensated for their work, and, and, we, and we were saying, you know, that we were having such a uh, issue with funding, you know, that we don't need to be compensated for this, you know, that, that would, the money would be better spent in just doing the work. Perhaps the greatest asset I brought was my ability to do fundraising. Ability to step into a leadership role. When a leadership role was not necessarily being asked for or wanted by others, but it was necessary. We uh, were very conscious of needing to go into Native communities very carefully and with a great deal of respect and with a great deal of uh, consent, people had to really want to be able to talk to us. It was a question of building trust and building relationships with people. The presence of, of nation states in the, in, excuse me, in the Americas presents uh, a, a kind of a global challenge because how does a people invading another people's land become recognized as a legitimate nation, one. And then how is it that the people whose lands are invaded do not 
become recognized as a legitimate nation. And that's the scenario that we're having to work with. The state continues to, um, what is an appropriate word, co-opt maybe processes that are um, grassroots led and that are seeking to provide justice for indigenous communities. Uh, so my biggest fear coming into this process was that um, the Wabanaki communities that we were working with weren't going to get what they wanted out of this process, that it was going to be somehow twisted to meet state objectives. That one of our key findings is that uh, tribal people are far more likely to report that these relationships are not good or are less trusting than non-native pe non -native people. So non-native people can often say, oh, it's great with the tribes. We do really well. We have this meeting, and this meeting, and this meeting. It went really smoothly, and we cooperate so well. Well, you'll hear a much less enthusiastic or much more cautious response from tribal people. And we feel that that, um, in, it, that finding needs to be interpreted through the lens of intergenerational trauma. There are hundreds of years of history of broken promises, of um, a lack of understanding, of, of treaties that were not honored, uh, so that every time, as one person uh, in a statement said, every time she sees a white person, she says, I wonder what's going to come out of your mouth. I wonder about those years of history behind you and what you were going to say to me next. There is not a tremendous amount of understanding of the level of relationship building that needs to happen before you can get to anything intensive. There's a very um, results-based drive. And I think for non-Indigenous people coming into a process like this, that there needs to be a lot of understanding that there, of the level of relationship building that needs to occur. So there with the hat of someone who's representing the, um, the, um, the flagship public university, um, representing sort of the profession, um, representing white social workers, representing educators who educate social workers. And I saw that um, basically we should be at the table because, because social workers were the folks who, um, for whatever reasons that they thought were good, um, had made some terrible decisions across the country and certainly, certainly in Maine. In order for these uh, kinds of transitional justice frameworks, such as truth and reconciliation processes to really be applicable and effective indigenous, in Indigenous communities, they really need to be responsive to what an Indigenous community wants to get out of the process and how they want that process to look. Um, in order for these kinds of commissions um, and these kinds of initiatives to be effective, they really need to be guided by Indigenous communities, and Indigenous communities must maintain control over that process. It, these kinds of initiatives will be inherently ineffective if they are solely guided by the state. The work is so exhausting, and it's so hard to find a common thread anywhere that oftentimes they never issue a report at all. They just kind of like fade away. They, you know, they just they can't absorb it all. And that was one of the things that we wanted to make sure that we didn't do, that we wanted to make sure that we finished our work, that we had something that people could turn to. The uh, relationship is between the communities here and the state, um, really getting at the root of those, um, the root of those conflicts and, and assessing and fleshing out um, the colonial relationship and working to uh, I really want to use the word change again, uh, working to create new relationships that are based on nation-to-nation -nation respect and dialogue. Um, role was working with the research coordinator and the research advisory board and helping the research coordinator around um, uh, just giving feedback around the protocols, interview protocols, when I started as the research coordinator, the first task that um, I kind of start, jumped on was uh, looking at the statement gathering process and how that would be structured um, with each community. 
and we, as a commission, um, set up kind of a framework process that we thought um, might be helpful, and we took that process to each individual community um, and asked for input as to what they felt was going to be most beneficial for them and how they wanted the process to work. We tried to structure the entire statement gathering process so that it was going to be responsive to whatever format someone wanted to share their experiences. Sometimes people gave statements jointly, sometimes they gave them individually. We also conducted focus groups because we realized at a certain point that these stories are collective and that people really wanted to tell these stories in a circle and to hear each other's experiences. Um, we also had informational interviews available for people to speak with us so that if they didn't have time or did not want to make a formal statement but they had a story or an experience to contribute, they could do so that way. To share really hard and challenging and discomforting and traumatizing aspects of their lives um, was incredibly heartbreaking a lot of the time, 95% of the time. Um, but. For me, healing in this process was allowing and creating space for individuals to share their experiences and to gain that sense of relief of feeling like they've really been heard by somebody. And to be heard by someone in an official capacity. Commission, we sought to try and ensure that individuals were taken care of. We, um, we made sure that each individual was put in contact with a community organizer who was a part of Maine Wabanaki Reach who really sought to try and provide that additional support at any point in time. For those of us that were the white commissioners um, looking to, looking to, to Sandy and Gizitanamuk to help lead the way in terms of you know, culturally appropriately entering into a community and I learned a lot from them. I could count on their bringing the spirituality and their bringing the tradition and ceremony that, that um, into when we, were, when we were in the community and also when we met together. We developed, I think, our own um, ceremonies. We also included a, um, a tissue ceremony, if you will, um, where after each community gathering, we um, we kept all of the tissues that were used in individual as well as group um, statement gathering and uh, sharing circles and burned those tissues as um, an offering. Um, it was incredibly important to have someone who, um, who has an Indigenous background, I guess you could say, it's someone who comes from community um, because there are a lot of protocols that are important and, and should be in place and are, are a part of our communities for a reason. And I, I think that those protocols may have been missed if it was somebody who was non-Indigenous. We really had to pause. We had to reflect. We had to feel very deeply what it is that we had come across. And because this issue affects children it affects the core of communities. It affects what many of us hold dearest in our lives, families, and how families are allowed to move forward in the world and experience their lives and experience their culture in the world. We felt that we could not just create a checklist of issues that needed to be remedied, concerns that could be addressed technically. We had to name some very deep truths we had to go further, perhaps, than what even our mandate had suggested that we needed to do. It would be coming into another territory. Uh, I wanted to make sure that it, I wouldn't be offensive in any way. So follow their lead, and, and I just always introduced myself in my language. I, I thanked them for letting me be a part of this process. So I did a lot of acknowledging of knowing I was a visitor to this territory. We never gave up on ourselves, even when things looked like they were gonna come unraveled, but we were able to make the most of every community visit. And um, you know, one of the things I learned long ago is if you go somewhere for a public speaking engagement and one person shows up, that's a success. There's one more person that you reach that you would not have reached if you hadn't gone. Along the way, um, there were a number of 
challenging moments and moments of discomfort. Um, but I think that the success of the commission as a whole would not have been possible without going through those kinds of challenging moments and working through that discomfort as a commission and with um, our partner organization as well as with communities. For other communities who choose to do a TRC process because you don't know quite what you're stepping into, but it's a different community, it's a different history, it's a different you know, relationship between their state child welfare and, and the tribal communities. So, um, yeah, I think they're just going to face that same sense of unknown and having to work their way through it. I think that this process helped individuals on a healing path. I don't think there are single moments um, where someone can pinpoint that, yes, healing has occurred, we can put a check in the box and move on. I think that engaging with this process helped to um, facilitate or further that healing for individuals. And um, I see that healing radiating out from the individual and into the family and through communities. You know, I, I, in, in my community, we have to, when we gather in ceremony, we always hold hands because we can feel the energy in that. And it reminds us that we're connected to everything outside of us. You know, everything is sacred. That's what we've been informed in our culture. And if we believe that everything is sacred, then there's absolutely no evil in the world. Something that we induce and create for our own imaginations and needs for dichotomy, 